Good evening Archaeosupians, Reese here for an Archaeoscope. As you all well know, Archaeoscope is an inverted questions of doom where basically we ask you guys a question and it is our fond hope as always that we get a big conglomerative answer um, or lots of um, answers back um, so we can kind of roll it into one nearly and get a more holistic idea of how to answer this question and how to talk about it, how to go about it really. Anyway, uh, the first thing I suppose I should talk about is how come I haven't done any solo uh, videos for the better part of nine months. Well, about nine months ago I moved back in with my family. Um, I have five younger brothers so as you can imagine um, it wasn't really an environment congruent to filming too much, there was a lot of background sound and there was just really never any time to able to actually do these films so Mr. Soup and I had to organise uh, half an hour here, half an hour there to fit in just the occasional Archeo chat. Anyway, this um, Archeoscope is in fact about uh, the town that I'm living in at the moment. Uh, it's about the city, I should say, city of Geelong. Geelong is about 64 kilometres south by southwest of Melbourne, which is the capital of Victoria. Now, I'm talking to you about Geelong today because it has, in my mind, a bit of a heritage issue, um, maybe even a bit of a media issue rather than a heritage issue, but heritage is in here. Um, and basically, what's happened is a local newspaper has written an article about a sculpture that was set back up in the centre of Geelong and basically missed the entire point of it. So instead of asking the right questions, the who, the what, the when, the where and the how, they asked if the sculptor's head was um, too big. Anyway, um, Basically, uh, when I read this article, I just had enough. I, there's been heritage um, articles in the past uh, in this particular newspaper, uh, which haven't really tickled my fancy too much. So I set up my own Geelong Heritage Facebook page, which you may have seen me uh, kind of stamping on Archeo Soup from time to time. Anyway, what you need to know about local media in Geelong. Well, there's three newspapers, the Geelong News, the Independent, and the Geelong Advertiser. The Geelong News is the community newspaper, does a lot of community announcements, etc. The Independent does a lot of financial stories, also works around the Geelong more regional areas. And then you've got the Geelong Advertiser. The Geelong Advertiser has a readership of about 25,000 subscribers these days. Uh, they're partially owned by the Murdoch conglomerate. Um, take that as you will. And they are seen to be probably the most um, uh, focused on Geelong newspaper there is. Anyway. As you can probably tell, this article was in fact written by the Geelong Advertiser. Um, I wouldn't even really call it too much of an article, more of a, a tabloid um, piece. Now, what this is about pretty much is a statue of the monarch Edward VII, who was a patron of sailors. Now, Geelong was a maritime hub. Um, in Victoria, so much so it gave Melbourne a run for its money. And what ended up happening was that um, Melbourne, during the gold rush period, depicted themselves on a map to immigrants as being much closer to the gold fields than Geelong was, which is completely inaccurate. Geelong's actually a couple of kilometres closer, um, I think. But the point being is that Melbourne was definitely not that close. The immigrants all started landing in Melbourne. Uh, a lot of labourers left Geelong and went to the gold fields. Geelong was pretty much left as a ghost town, um, same as Melbourne to a degree, but Melbourne was then made the capital within a few short years after the gold rush. 
anyway, uh, Geelong, main, its main industries were wool and, as I've stated, maritime industries. But what's more interesting about it is that it was such a hub that it has a well, it has over 200 maritime shipwrecks along the Ballerine Peninsula and um, further along the Otway Coast. Um, I know that's probably not a terribly uh, uh, happy thing to think about, but one thing that I, I thought I should point out here is a specific shipwreck which is only 200 metres off the Corio Bay coast, which is where Geelong um, sits around. There's a shipwreck called the Lightning. It's a clipper ship that has a very uh, important distinction. It was the fastest ship in the world during the time it was um, uh, in use. It sank in 1869, unfortunately, because um, a fire broke out on board, so they pushed it away from the pier before that caught a light and then the thing burnt down. Couldn't be recovered, so they scuttled it just in the bay. And anyway, this ship was built in the United States. It travelled generally from Liverpool to New Zealand, from New Zealand to Geelong and Melbourne. Did a lot of trading there. So, as you can understand, it was the fastest ship in the world. It's, what's it doing in Geelong? Well, Geelong's a very important maritime trade, um, trading city at this time. So it makes sense that a patron of sailors has a sculpture in the city. And in 1877, um, the sculpture of, this, um, of Edward VII uh, was set up down here and stayed in Geelong, in the Geelong um, CBD area, as it's known today, Central Business District. It was there until uh, 1970 when a car, unfortunately, whether it was a drunk driver, we're not sure, crashed directly into the statue, took off an arm, its right arm, and uh, part of the foot of the statue and the head had also come off. Quite talented if you ask me. But um, the head was never recovered. Council at the time during the 1960s and 70s decided that they didn't have enough money to put back into a classical piece like this. And at this time, local council was trying to create a, a new city, Geelong, um, a modern city. Um, and what ended up happening was a lot of these classical architectural buildings were destroyed, pulled down. Um, this statue is obviously remnants of that um, neglect. And this statue, this sculpture, was in fact left on council property to basically rot somewhere. Anyway, uh, move along to 2013. What we then have is... Um, Council is putting money into heritage. The local councillor, Tony Ansett, along with um, the City of Greater Geelong's uh, Arts and Culture Department, finds $25,000 to put to a project. This project comes up the restoration of this Italian marble uh, sculpture. And what ends up happening is a local individual, and this is, I suppose, part of my question here, is that this local individual by the name of uh, Mr. Frank Costa, who's a philanthropist, um, a, 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 a supporter of local history and heritage. He's um, also a, a great supporter of the arts um, and a multi-millionaire, by the way, just so you get the idea. And the businessman, he, he, he puts $25,000 in of his own money to help the restoration of this specific statue. He claims no rights of ownership over it. He's just done this as, I suppose, a civic duty as a citizen. He, he, he's done a fantastic job in my books, which kind of opens up this question of should there be a more, um, I suppose, recognised way that philanthropists um, can, in fact, uh, put some patronage, I suppose, of 
historical and heritage artifacts and pay for um, restoration projects like this in conjunction with local government bodies. It's an interesting concept. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. But moving on to the actual media aspect of this now, with the three newspapers in Geelong, only one of them had done a story about this um, statue uh, in the first week, which was the advertiser. It took a week for them to do it, but basically they asked, is the statue's head too big in this local tabloid fashion? And I think this is a disgrace because they don't ask the, the real questions, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. And why is it important to the people of Geelong? They don't know. In fact, they don't even know who to ask. They talk to a local, as they put it, history buff. Now, that term, history buff, it's not really offensive, but it's certainly not something you would call a tenured professor of archaeology or history or art, art history, things like that. They ask a gentleman who, in fact, is... Um, very interested in Geelong's heritage. He's a good man. He volunteers a lot of time and I won't use his name. He's not at any fault here and he basically said he didn't know why the statue's head was too big. I mean, not surprisingly, he's, he's, he doesn't study this stuff. Um, I mean, who does? I have to research it. But basically, that's the point. People in the heritage profession research this stuff and know how to go about this stuff. They know how to avoid stepping in the pseudo and in the unreliable and unrealistic. So I'll give you a quick run over why this statue's head may be a bit larger than what um, Edward VII's head may have been. Two reasons. It may actually be proportionate and his body's actually in fact quite small. This potentially could have happened because uh, people during this time, during this Victorian time, the gentry rarely, if ever, ate vegetables. Now, this came about because the vegetables were basically seen as a um, peasant's food, uh, something that you didn't eat. It wasn't fashionable. So there was a lot of diseases that came with being the gentry, such as gout and scurvy. And this led to, obviously, gross problems, which Edward VII was about five, four, five, five. Um, as far as we can tell, he really did suffer of, from this, um, unfortunately. So, potentially, his body's just quite small and his head looks disproportionately bigger. You do see this kind of thing on people who are starving around the world. You go, why do they have such large heads? Well, the fact is their bodies are just really small and it's quite sad to think about but the point being is that uh, that's one reason the other is in fact a more I suppose historical uh, approach to this uh, question the classical Greek and Roman um, sculptors generally focused on the extremities such as the hands and the feet to put a lot of detail in the face was the other one see because Back in these times, um, the way you would recognise somebody's statue is, well, how much a likeness is the statue of them. And this continues, obviously, on um, during the revival of um, or the Enlightenment, uh, then further on into the Victorian time. Well, of course, you're going to want to know who you're actually looking at, um, which monarch is it that you're looking at. Edward VII you'd be able to recognise him 100 metres away if you lived during the time of his reign. be pretty easy. Today, if we saw the same statue of, of Elizabeth II in Australia, people would know who she is from 100 metres away. It just so happens this monarch has been dead for the better part of 130 years. But that's part of the problem, is that the advertiser didn't actually look into this historical perspective of this heritage um, uh, uh, sculpture. It, it didn't look into this issue at all. It um, basically wanted to make, a, and this is something that um, you probably may or may not agree with me, 
they're trying to make a political statement here by saying two things. The first one being that the Geelong Advertiser is notorious for saying um, Geelong City Council does bad projects, puts money in the wrong places, it should all go to homeless people. Why doesn't it go to homeless people and the disenfranchised? Well, the truth of the answer is, is that the Geelong City Council in fact runs many programs for the disenfranchised um, in one way or another when they actually don't have to. It's not part of local council's responsibility to do that stuff. They just choose to do that. And what the problem with that is, is that the Geelong advertiser then sees it as a mandate to say, well, you're not doing enough. Um, and I think that's quite sad because it has upset a lot of people at um, the Geelong City Council because they do try very hard with this stuff. I would in fact like to see how much the advertiser donates to um, homeless and disenfranchised people by comparison to Geelong City Council. I mean, neither of them have a mandate to do it, but I think one of them does a lot more than the other. Anyway, moving along um, from local politics, um, the other issue here is that the Geelong advertiser, the reporter who obviously um, was tasked with this, didn't do their research, didn't uh, ask the appropriate people. Now, I personally think that a reporter who does a report on a historical sculpture being put back into the city of Geelong should probably talk to people who study and train in heritage, whether it be an archaeologist, an archivalist, an art historian, a historian, even a genealogist. You could have asked any one of those number of people. A lot of them probably wouldn't have known but like me, they would have known where to look to get the right answers to give you a good story, a well-informed story, not asking a history buff, as they so eloquently put it again. They could have just done the story a bit better. And the problem is, is that this has happened before on issues of heritage and stories of historical importance. They just don't ask the right people whether it's because they don't care, I'm not sure. We just have to, I suppose, put some pressure on them. And I have started to do that, in fact. I've started a Facebook page which has the blessing of the uh, local council, um, the Geelong Heritage Group, where people from different heritage uh, organisations can come, can talk about um, issues in heritage down here. Um, Unfortunately, there's been a lot of uh, Facebook pages and politics that go along with that. Um, this Facebook page has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with the issues of heritage and heritage only. So I, I, I'm very happy if you would um, take a look at that Archaeosupians. I know I've advertised it a little bit, probably it's with little to no avail, but um, it is an important issue to, to spread um, good heritage practice run by heritage professionals and enthusiasts together to get the right stories out, to get the right information out. And I really hope that um, eventually the local media starts to take issues of heritage and historical significance a little bit more seriously. Anyway, what do you guys think? Do you think that I'm being a bit too hard on local tabloid news do you think well you don't have to read it if you don't like it I understand that but what do you honestly think do you think local media worldwide should have a mandate to in fact cover stories of um, historical and heritage issues and events in a better way than what's been done here anyway Thank you all so much for watching. I've been so happy to get back into this. Hopefully I'll be putting out at least a video a week from now on. Let's get back into it. And um, I'll see you all next week.